My name is Lacey Leone McLaughlin. This is Unfolding Leadership. Todd has spent more than 20 years working at the intersection of finance and equality, first as an investment banker before joining Merrill Lynch as head of diversity and strategy and Credit Suisse as head of diversity and inclusion. Todd created the first team of financial advisors in Wall Street focused on the LGBTQ plus community and brought almost 2 billion of new assets to Merrill Lynch from LGBTQ plus couples and nonprofit organizations. Additionally, he is the founding chair of Jeffrey Fashion Cares, which raised more than $8 million for LGBTQ and HIV causes under his decade of leadership. And he is currently the CEO of Out Leadership, the world's premier global platform for businesses to drive LGBTQ plus equality. I am honored to have him on the podcast. Thanks for joining me here today, Todd. Thanks, Lucy. It's nice to be here. Yeah, yeah. So I've had a chance to to get to know you a bit and learn a little bit more about what you're doing, but I'd love for our listeners to hear what you're doing today and sort of your origin stories of how you got here. Yeah. Well, currently I'm the founder and CEO of Out Leadership, which is the first and only global LGBT business organization. Now, what does that mean? You may ask. That means that I've been able to somehow convince thousands of CEOs and businesses to leverage their economic platform to drive LGBT equality all over the world. Um, and we can talk about how we got there. But that's, yeah, that's, so actually that's what, what I'm going to say right one now. more time is, again, what does that mean? <laughs> well, I originally started with a summit. And actually, maybe let's just back up to how we even got to that, if the origin story is where we want to go. I um, I started in investment banking out of college and then switched sides of the world and went into private banking at Merrill Lynch. And the way that that works is they give you a phone, a desk, a computer, and they say, bring in a million dollars a month of net new assets. And if after eight months, if you don't have $8 million under management, sign there, you're fired. The idea is $24 million in 24 months. And I was 25 at the time. So it was, it was just like 24, 24, ago. 25. Yeah, exactly. Nice. 24, 24, 25. Mm-hmm. Um, and I had to put together a business plan for how I was going to do that. And if you could think back to 2001, which is when this was, there were no federal, there was no federal recognition of gay and lesbian couples. Uh, marriage equality wasn't on the horizon. But also companies were not speaking to LGBTQ people. And so I had this idea that I could put together a business model and a business plan to help gay and lesbian couples protect their financial future. And so I went to the head of the Merrill office on Fifth Avenue and said, here's my idea. And he's like, all right, kid, cool, because ultimately it would either sink or you know, sink or swim. Yeah. Um, and I did. So the first 12 months, I brought in $100 million. Uh, and over the first five years, I brought in almost $2 billion to Merrill from the LGBT community. Half of it was gay and lesbian couples and half of it was LGBT nonprofits. I managed their endowments and built their client giving programs. But along the way, and this is the part that leads to what I'm doing now, is that I tracked it as a business. I didn't say that Merrill was trying to do the warm, fuzzy, right thing to do. Of course it was, for me anyway. But I was actually helping bring in business. And for them to actually understand that, then the corollary or the actual reason that we were able to do that was that I actually got Merrill to support LGBT rights. In 2001, Merrill Lynch had never supported a gay or lesbian organization. They hadn't spent money in the gay market. Most companies hadn't at that time. And five years later, they were spending $3 million to support LGBT rights because I tied it to a bottom line business opportunity. And that was a a pretty exciting, cool thing for lots of reasons. One, I got to keep my job. Um, (laughs) Upside, total upside. I mean, total upside, right? Employment matters. Um, but I also got an old Irish Catholic command and control company like Merrill Lynch to support gay rights because I proved it was a business. Uh, I was also their first openly gay financial advisor. So in a 92 year history of the firm, that had never happened. And so I was able to leverage that platform in another way, which was to actually have an opportunity to be out and visible on Wall Street, which in 2001, 2002, 2003 was, was a big change. That was not, uh, you didn't see, especially when I came out in the late, in the mid nineties, you didn't see gay bankers, you didn't see gay lawyers, you didn't have gay CEOs. And so my, 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 I guess, mission in life in this respect is pushing for gay equality, but also being a role model and being visible and all of that matters. Yeah. So um, all of that matters. That is amazing. But I'm just trying to think, so this, this podcast is about leadership and there is just so much that we can uncover and poke at within what you just said in terms of your origin story, but help me understand you're a 25 year old kid. This is all new. And you're like, I am going to take on this framework that hasn't been challenged for the last hundred, you know, couple hundred years. And I'm going to one, do some things personally that haven't been done. And two, I'm going to make this a business. How did you get there? How does that happen? How does that come into the head of a 25 year old? Um, 
Well, I'm lucky in that way. I, I've had ideas like that my whole life, going all the way back into high school and pre, you know, even probably pre that. Um, I also moved around a lot. I went to nine different schools before I went to boarding school as an only child who knew he was gay at five. So my ability to walk into any space and not have fear and to be able to think creatively and connect with lots of different people has been a skill that I've, I've been able to, to leverage. In, in terms of how it actually happened, I, I'd say a couple of things. One, the investment bank that I worked in prior to, to Merrill Lynch um, was a small firm called De Silva and Phillips. And we were able to actually, by virtue of me being out in my interview to them, uh, which was not the case for my first investment bank. I actually had a homophobe for a boss for my first investment bank and left that firm. Um, but I was out of my interview to them. And because I was out, I was able to actually, they were actually able to leverage my connections and my understanding of a community. And I didn't really think of it at the time, but I was able to help bring in business because I was parked by a CEO who happened to be gay, a CEO of a media company. Mm -hmm. And so that that learning was in my head when I went to Merrill. The second thing was that at that time, there were 1,049 rights at a federal level that gay and lesbian couples didn't receive, and 90% of them were financial. So I thought, hmm, that's an opportunity because I've been an advocate and advocate activist my whole life. So that's that's an opportunity to change the world, which is important. But then also, from a loyalty perspective and a disposable income perspective, gay and lesbian people have, at that time, fewer fewer folks had kids and that has changed more and more and more and more gay and lesbian couples do have children now. But at that time we had a phrase called DINK, dual income, no kids. And so from an investment opportunity and a market opportunity, it's, it's sort of a sweet spot, right? You have specific mm -hmm. financial issues that can be addressed, disposable income that needs to be invested and, and high loyalty for companies that support our community and support gay rights. Mm -hmm. And so those were sort of the, the three data points, I suppose, that I, I used and then I, I got creative. I um, <laughs> I called the Merrill Marketing Department and asked what we had sponsored. And at that time, Merrill Lynch had supported and sponsored a Matisse Picasso exhibition at MoMA Queens. And that was when MoMA, the Museum of Modern Art here in New York, moved out to Queens for a huge remodeling. Yeah. And I think Merrill spent probably five million bucks on it. And so I asked the marketing folks, I said, well, what did you get for that? What do we have? You know, what, what does Merrill Lynch get for that? And one of the things on that list was that we had five nights at the museum that were covered in free. And you would have a docent led tour and a catalog. And I said, well, could I have two of those nights and bring prospects and clients in? And they said, sure, they would love it because no one had actually signed up for it. No one had actually asked to use any of the nights that Merrill had paid for. Oh, wow. And, and so then I went around to wholesalers and I got a thousand bucks from this person, a thousand bucks from this person. Basically, all I had to pay for was the catering, but I still had to raise that money from the different wholesalers. And so I connected to them around, do you want to support LGBT rights? Would you like to talk to gay and lesbian, gay and lesbian couples? And then I went to two nonprofits, Lambda Legal, uh, actually three, Lambda Legal, GLAD, and the New York LGBT Center. And I offer them for the first night, Lambda, invite 200 of your major donors, people that have supported your movement and our rights, but have never gotten an opportunity to be thanked, right? Because most nonprofit events, you have to buy a ticket, a table, yeah. spend money. When does a nonprofit get an opportunity to take 200 people to the MoMA for a private evening with the docent and to see Matisse Picasso? Never. And so that kind of catapult to me for the first uh, for the first year. So I am just I'm writing notes uh, like crazy here because I'm hearing <laughs> things um, when we think about it. Like First, I love the focus on the business idea and then connecting that to something you're passionate about. And then the innovation, all three of those things are, are critically important when we think about leadership. So that's sort of your foundation where you started. Talk to me about where you're today and how those three things still ring true. Well, at first, I really agree. I, I, I want to just comment on what you just said. The idea that I think great leaders have to have a passion for what they do and what drives them. There's no other way to be a great leader. You can't inspire followership if you're not inspiring. And that comes from being passionate about what you do and believing in what you do. Um, even from a quote unquote sales perspective, I jokingly always used to say to my dad, my dad always used to say, I'd be a great salesman. And I just, I had this image in my head of a used car salesman whenever he would say that. I'm like, that's not me. I'm never going to do that. And he laughs at me now that I've been able to convince leaders all over the world to support gay rights. He's like, that's called sales talk. <laughs> um, so to, to, to the Isn't it inconvenient that our parents are most of the time pretty right? It's so annoying. And he still is. I mean, it's, you know, but my parents have been my biggest champions, which is amazing. I'm very lucky. I asked just as a sidebar from the LGBT perspective, I, I, I knew I was gay when I was five. And I asked my mom what gay was in 1981. And my mom, being the amazing empath nurse that she is, said, that's when two men love each other. And I said, 
okay, cool. And a week later, I said, could I be gay? And she's like, you could be, and that would be all right. And I share that for lots of reasons, but primarily because in 1981, that was not the zeitgeist of the world, right? I was incredibly lucky to have that. Um, and I think that's been foundational for a lot of my success is having just supportive parents. Yeah. And how different everything would look today I'm assuming, if, a converse, if those two conversations went differently. Yeah, that's exactly right. That's exactly right. Yeah. So I, um, I, I got a lot of visibility at Merrill Lynch uh, for doing what I was doing. I got a, a meeting with the head of wealth management after my first year because I was this kid that brought in 100 million bucks. Um, Seems like that happens. Yeah. 100 million yeah. bucks. You get to meet with the big bosses. Yeah. Yeah. And I, <clears throat> and I went in armed with a whole deck and I said, I want to do this across the country. And I did 40 million bucks from you. And he actually gave it to me. And the idea was I had to report back to him once a quarter on the ROI of his investment. And I later found out that in 37 years of Maryland, she'd never given another financial advisor a dollar. There were 16,000 other guys like me, guys, women, folks like me. Um, and the idea was that he wanted ROI around more assets, but also more financial advisors that leveraged my idea, which I later found out was a little bit of a trick. It was a test he told me two years later. He took me to dinner and he asked me to come work for him and to leave my book. And he said, Todd, financial advisors don't share, right? You may have the same logo on your card that says Merrill Lynch, but everybody's out for themselves. You're basically an independent contractor. Yeah. It's like, but you have 243 financial advisors that are using your idea to support gay and lesbian couples. That's leadership, right? And that was a, a pivot point for me because I ultimately then accepted the offer that he made me to run diversity strategy for Merrill Lynch for wealth management. And did that for a couple of years. And then I was recruited away to Credit Suisse to lead diversity inclusion for them across the Americas, uh, which was a totally different experience on lots of levels, much more global, um, much more challenging from from lots of perspectives, including a lot of the, the turmoil the bank had gone through and just went through recently. But the, the real pivot into what I'm doing now came in 2010 when I got laid off because of all the turmoil and a lot of politics, mm -hmm. actually, um, which we can get into. Um, I found myself on my sofa with a severance check and several Hendrix martinis. And I thought, what's next? And I thought back to when I was the happiest and when I felt like I was making the most impact in the world. And it was when I was at Merrill and I got the Irish Catholic Command and Control Company to support gay rights. And in 2010, you did not have CEOs speaking about LGBT rights. That had actually not happened. Uh, you didn't have businesses using their economic power to advocate for equality. This is obviously way pre-marriage equality. And I thought, you know what, if I could get one company to do it, could I get more? And that was the simple premise. And so I used my severance check and I funded I funded a summit I called Out on the Street originally. And the idea was just Wall Street because that was all I knew. Mm -hmm. And I had six banks, Bank of America, Barclays, Citi, Deutsche, Goldman Sachs, and Morgan Stanley. And I got the then CEO of Deutsche Bank, Seth Waugh, to host my first summit. I looked at Davos, World Economic Forum. I thought, could I create a, a mini gay Davos? Um and we were 200% oversubscribed for the first summit. And the framework was, and still is, business, talent, and equality. But I wanted the leaders in the room because they understood that this is a business opportunity for their companies. They have to have the right talent to execute on that opportunity. And equality is the output, but also required for both of the first two. And we grew from there. So I launched in London 12 years ago. I launched in Asia and Hong Kong 11 years ago. We were the first gay summit ever in Asia. And then Sydney, Australia, nine years ago. And so we've now had 119 summits on five continents um, and have grown to, as I mentioned in the beginning, to be the first global LGBT business organization. The, the cool part is as we've grown, the, the summits are just a convening to have conversation. But the important thing is the action that comes out of them. And I'll, I'll talk about that. And then the talent issues we built as well. But I, I think that the exciting thing, and this goes to the leadership framework for this conversation, is that. All of these leaders want to use their platform to drive change. It's been so exciting to see the light bulb go off with CEOs yeah. who in their day job make money for other people, for example, right? But because I give them a platform, Lloyd Blankfein, the former chairman and CEO of Goldman Sachs was my first board member. And the opportunity for him to use the platform that he has to say to Singapore at that time, being gay was so legal in Singapore, it just changed not even a year ago, to say to Singapore, you know what? This is bad for my talent. And he's the CEO of Goldman Sachs. They listen to him. They don't, they don't know who Todd Sears is, right? And that's the model that I built. It's the soft power model of letting leaders use their platforms to drive change. Yeah. So say more about soft power. <laughs> well, it, it's, I think, one of the more important, if not the most important way to create change. It's an influence model. It's the idea that you're, you're taking the platform that you have 
And one, I think bringing people along. Um, I think the soft power piece is quite different. You know, hard power is do this, command and control, mm-hmm. right? But soft power is an influence model. You have an opportunity to bring people together, but by virtue of your platform, um, that's the that's the reason people will come together. So the the CEO just taking the, the Lloyd Blank Fund example in one of our meetings, he, he uh, I, and I always it always blew my mind that I got a quarterly meeting with Lloyd Blank Fund. I thought, you know, what the heck does that cost, right? Um, is that but, when you realized you had influence? <laughs> <laughs> I'm still I'm still waiting for that moment in your head where you're 25, 28, and you're like, oh, people are listening to me. <clears throat> well, that's a funny thing. I don't actually think of it that way. Hmm. Um, I, I I have these moments when I I'm like so incredibly grateful and lucky to do what I do and to have had all these years buy into me, my ideas, but more importantly, do something. Um, but I've never really thought about it in that way. There's never been like a moment uh, when I'm like, oh, I have influence. Yeah. Um, so you just kept putting your head down and chugging through. And then all of a sudden you're hosting summits all over the world with some of the most powerful people in banking. I just. <laughs> well, when you put it that way, my gosh. <laughs> I'm taken aback because you are probably one of the most values driven individuals I've ever come across from a business perspective. And yet you're more focused on business, business talent, equality is what you keep saying in the underlying connections to that, as well as in in terms of leaders that I've met. So it's pretty amazing from my perspective to see you're driven by the business, but guided by the values. Is that fair? Thank you. Yeah, it it is fair. I mean, I think my personal drive versus the drive of the people that I'm trying to influence as well, right? I think the my personal drive is equality. I'm the least concerned about money of most of my friends from Wall Street. I, if I wanted to make millions of dollars, I would have stayed on Wall Street. Um, money is not my driver. Impact and equality is. Um, and to you know to, to put a, a data point on that, there's still 67 countries in the world where it's still illegal to be gay. But in all of those countries, the out leadership member companies do business. And so from a soft power perspective, my framework is if I can have them leverage their economic platform, my goal is in 10 years, would it be amazing if there could be no sodomy laws left, which mm-hmm. by the way, sodomy laws are the predicator for every other piece of discrimination that the LGBTQ community faces. Mm-hmm. Um, but I, you're right. I I think it is both. I think the, the business framing matters because companies will do what's in their bottom line, sustainable best interest on an ongoing basis if you tie it to what helps them. And equality does, and whether it's their brand, their recruiting, their client opportunity. And a lot of companies just don't think of it that way. They think about diversity broadly as something that HR runs. And I think that's a massive mistake. They miss out on 90% of the opportunity, yeah. right? Like people say, oh, well, it's the LGBT community is a small percentage of the world. It used to be 7%, now 20% of Gen Z identify as LGBTQ. And I say, yeah, that's true, but 90% of people identify as allies in one way, shape, or form. And you would have no idea who has a gay kid, a trans kid, et cetera, et cetera. So what you do for a small minority actually has a much bigger impact. And so the, the idea of values in business, I think, is massive. That's why I started as, as a, we're, we're organized as a B Corporation. Mm. Our leadership was the first gay B Corp in history. And we're still the only gay B Corp, which for those who don't know, B Corps are social enterprises. And that means we reinvest our profits and our mission. And we actually made a decision years ago to donate 20% of our pre-tax profits back to gay nonprofits. So we have 74 nonprofit partners around the world that we support as well, not just financially, but we include them in all of the work that we do. So mm-hmm. it's a it's a cool opportunity, I guess, to come back to your point, to to drive values and equality through a business lens. Yeah, yeah. And, and clearly you've had a huge amount of success, success. And there's been some bumps and bruises along the way. Talk to me about some of your bumps and bruises or opportunities to learn from some of the challenges you face getting where you are today. I think it's it's an interesting time right now because I think the the bruises, the most the the most bruises we've had in the 13 years have actually been in the last 12 months um, because of the world that we live in right now, the quote unquote anti-woke, the challenges that companies have that are you know being pilloried by Republicans for supporting diversity and inclusion broadly, LGBT rights, you know, the backlash against Bud Light or Target. I mean, all of those things have made it challenging for us. What's fascinating is companies are not actually pulling back, but they don't want to be as visible. Mm-hmm. Um, and that's that's a little bit of a challenge, right, from a getting support, um, but also finding ways that they can be. And we have been able to. Um, and I can talk more, more about that. I think other bumps that I've learned just from a leadership perspective, my, as I mentioned to you earlier, the 
the nine different schools and boarding school, et cetera, as an only child, I've been a pretty independent operator um, and just flying around the world doing this. Yeah. Um, and I was kind of struck. I had a meeting with a senior, a, a senior KPMG leader last week or two weeks ago. And I was just talking about the next 10 years of our leadership. And I've got a, a what I call our, our vision statement, ambition statement. And he's like, well, you know, have you have you talked about the roundtables that you're a part of and other small business associations and da, 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 all of these other things? I'm like, I don't have any of those things. I don't go to any CEO of roundtables other than the ones I create that are focused around this issue. I don't have like a, a peer group of small business owners uh, that I can connect with and swap stories, et cetera. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I think that's actually been a big, that's been a bit of an aha for me in terms of where I'm taking this now, because I am going to have to think about investment capital for our leadership as well as structurally what I what I want this to be. Um, I think that the only other bumps really have been around, I don't even call them bumps, but from a soft power influence model, I'm just one guy with a company of 15 people. Um, and we haven't even talked about talent initiatives that we built yet, but the, the bumps are when people don't buy into it mm-hmm. and I always have to re-explain. And it's 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 a bump, but it's an opportunity. I'm I'm the eternal optimist. If you haven't picked up on that, so I I, I tend to <laughs> to find opportunities and problems. Um, but that is that is some of the. I think that would be some of the uh, that, that would be the challenge. I would say is as companies evolve and people change within a company, having to re-explain, having to re-engage, um, and you have different people that have different mindsets about what this is and and what the risk to the company could be. Um, and those have created some bumps along the way, but. For the vast majority of the time, it's created much more opportunity than a problem. Yeah, yeah. So what are you doing about that networking piece? Because it's hard building and collaborating with people and creating a team and letting go of the things that you used to do so you could do other things. I mean, really, that's scaling, right? Um, so what are you doing? How are you thinking about it? How are you getting out of your own way there? Yeah, that's a great question. Well, I think for the for the first time in the in the organization's history, we have, I, I think, the absolute best team. Um, COVID was an interesting opportunity for us to actually grow. We added 22 additional member companies. We had some some turnover that I think was a, a really good refresh of the team. And so the team that I have now has been together for a decent amount of time and is really just firing on all cylinders. Um, and one of my team actually complimented me last week, who's been with me, a woman named Kenya, who will almost be with me for five years who, uh, who actually said, she's like, just so you know, we're so proud of you because you've been letting go all of this year. So exactly she used the words you used. Um, which so is you great. realize that is a very nice compliment and reminder of something you need to continue to work on. <laughs> thousand percent. thousand percent. Um, and, and I'm very well aware of it. I mean, I've done lots of therapy in my life slash had lots of great coaches and mentors, et cetera. So I, I know it's a, a leadership skill that I need to own more on. Um, but I will say that, and and maybe this is, you know, part for the course for anyone. But if you're not just a small business owner, but the goal of the business is equality, that's something that is so personal to you, it mm-hmm. makes it even harder, right? We're, I, I like to say, we're the first company in history whose sole product is LGBT equality. That's literally all we do. And there's never been a company that's done that before. And so that's, there, there's a an extra drive to me that we have to be successful um, and not from a getting rich perspective, but from an impact perspective. Um, and I've been lucky enough, as I said, to have so many other people who buy into that. And that's why we have them. But, yep. but I totally know that I've got to let go more. And I, I'll have to when we get investment capital, right? That'll be part of the deal, which I think will be exciting. Yeah. So no disrespect in this question. You're doing amazing work. Why haven't I heard more about it? Mm. No disrespect at all. That's been kind of by design. Um, and one of the goals of our marketing team this uh, this summer for next year is to quote unquote, quote unquote, make our leadership famous. Um, part of it is the way that I've been able to do it. The way that we've been able to have impact is to be able to have quiet conversations with these leaders mm. and to be the partner to these leaders. Um, as I mentioned, I've worked with over 1,200 CEOs over the last 13 years. And I look at the opportunity to be their advisor and to help companies create change, less about bragging about it and definitely less about sort of the name and shame. Um, a lot of folks in any of the DEI spaces or the LGBT spaces really want to focus on like the finger wagging, et cetera. I'd rather take people where they are and help make them better. Um, and you can't really do that if you're, you know, if you're the police or if you're the, the, the people that want to expose them, et cetera. Um, I think the second part of it is it's just part of my personality. Um, 
you know, I, I'm, as you mentioned earlier, just kind of the head down going around and doing the things. Mm-hmm. And now we're at the point that I really do think we should talk about it because it gives us the cred- credibility and the gravitas to actually continue to do more. Uh, I got a great compliment last year. We had a, our CEO dinner. Um, we've had 60 something CEO dinners around the world. Um, and one of the CEOs in the room said, you know, Todd, you realize you're the, you're the adult in the room and the LGBT team with the globe. And I, I was really struck and touched by that, but I, I take that seriously in the yeah. sense that I'm not going to be the person who's going to jump into every political fray because back to your question about soft power, right? How do I, how do I do that? If I'm the person that's trusted, knowledgeable, experienced, that's a, that's a, and it, it's a, it's a catch 22. Um, we are launching a new campaign. We're creating a new level of support. So our, the way that we're funded is through membership and sponsorship. So we have hundred multinational companies that pay a membership fee every year and they have access to everything we do. All of our events are curated. They're not, they're not ticketed. They're invitation only. Uh, but we're creating a new level called support so that any company in the world can support the work about leadership. And it's at a $10,000 level, super easy, but they get to align themselves to the brand. But more importantly, understand that they're helping support all the work we're doing all over the world. And so I think all of those pieces will start to get more visibility. Um, yeah. But we're, we're the sort of, we were, there was an article about a year and a half ago that said we were the most important LGBT organization that you'd never heard of. Yeah, yeah. I, I'm not surprised. I mean, I think about what you're saying, and it's the partnership and the collaboration, but ultimately what's driving, I would assume <clears throat> the reason they keep coming back is the trust. They trust you to do the right thing and to help them with their business in a way that makes sense, right? You mentioned sort of the finger wagging and the adult in the room and all of that to me sounds like there's, they've been, maybe they've been burned a bit. Well, they've been burned a bit. And I think if you think about the demographics, just taking the CEOs, not just the companies, but the CEOs themselves as individuals, 90% of them are straight white men, mm-hmm. right? And okay. every diversity initiative in the last 30 years has told them they're the bad guys. They're yeah. the problem, right? You're not good for women. You're bad for black people, bad for gay, whatever it's, whatever it is. Mm-hmm. Um, and I don't tell them that. Now, I also, when I talk to young leaders, we had our Out Next Summit. We, we should talk about the talent pieces we built as well. It's pretty cool. We had 220 young LGBT leaders at our 10th annual out next summit last week from 11 countries. Um, and I tell them, look, I, I also realized that I have white male straight passing privilege, right? I went to Duke, I could talk basketball and bro out and blah, blah, blah. And especially in 2001, you know, I looked the part of a, a straight banker and then I'd come out and, you know, people would be like, oh, okay, cool. Right. But, but there's, there's a reality to that because that makes people comfortable. I can make people comfortable with me with my background. And then once I have that access, then I can actually help drive change. Um, and so I think that's, that's also been a big piece of it is being able to find ways to connect to these leaders. Um, and, and they've been incredibly open to it, which has been pretty great. Yeah. Yeah. So recognizing the access that you've had, and then you've mentioned a couple of times that talent piece, tell me more about that. So when I started the summits out on the street was the first, yep. the second was called out in law, because I thought, you know what, Obviously, law firms, big opportunity to create change. And who are their biggest clients? Banks, right? So if I have mm-hmm. this sort of ecosystem and I thought, okay, would I create more verticals? Because I'm definitely a serial entrepreneur. Um, and I thought, no, you know what? I'm going to create an umbrella out leadership and, and any company can be a part of it. That actually merges the opportunity. Um, and so then the next thing I did was I thought, all right, I've got senior leaders. Now, what is there for the next generation of LGBT talent in the workplace? And well, I guess 11 years ago, there was nothing. And so I built out next. And the idea about Next is there are young leaders from any of my member companies, five to eight years in their career, high potential, high performing with diversity in the cohort. So I told the companies, you have to focus on diversity at that level. Um, And we've now had almost 11,000 young leaders that have gone through that program on five continents as well. And the opportunity is to have have these young leaders understand what I call their outvantage, because I do think it is an advantage to being LGBTQ, because you have high levels of empathy. We're always on the outside. We are always seeking psychological safety in any room we go into, but that also means we're also paying attention to everyone in the room. We're trying to make sure that that you're okay. I walk in, I'm like, Lacey, is, Lacey, is Lacey okay? I'm paying attention, right? I noticed mm-hmm. that she did something different with her hair, or if she's looking like she's a little bit upset about something, right? That's yeah. a that's a big skill. Um, and empathy, as I'm sure you've discovered or know, is one of the highest you know ranked leadership traits in the world. Um, and so that's been an exciting journey to have these young leaders have that opportunity to understand um, what they have in spades. We've actually done research. We've published 23 pieces of research in the last 13 years as well. 
One of them was called How to Succeed. And we just published the second version of it last week at this Out Next Summit. And for my generation, I'm Gen X, 11% of women and 70% of gay men said that being LGBT was an asset in our career. For this young cohort, when we looked at Gen Y, mm-hmm. 60% of them, 60% said it was an asset. Well, the new research we launched last week, 80% now say it's an asset in their career. Amazing. So the, obviously the world has continued to change in a really positive way. And these young leaders know that. And it's been really kind of cool to, to see that happen. Yeah. I also just love that you're taking the empathy, which is something that you're, you, you recognize is important and you're helping them translate it back to business, right? This is something we do. This is something we've had grown up doing. Now let's figure out how we can leverage it in terms of how we show up in the workplace. That's exactly right. Love it. Love because it. the workplace, unfortunately, is not always the meritocracy that we'd like it to be. Yeah. Yeah. Right? And how you connect directly connects to how your career progression goes. Yeah. I mean, the numbers that you're giving me are, I mean, crazy. The number of countries, 80% an asset in terms of showing up in the workplace, um, 11,000 high potential leaders. I mean, these numbers are crazy. There's a lot to be proud of here. I took, um, I took down some notes and it's take people where they are and make them better. So you also mentioned earlier on in our conversation, some of the things that are happening in the world and the world is a challenging place right now, across the board, right? Um, And then you have this philosophy, take people where they are and make them better. How do you reconcile that? How do you reconcile what you're trying to do, everything that's happening in the world? I mean, some days we all wake up and we're like, oh, this is just a lot. We lost another right or this is looking like this. I mean, it's a lot, right? It is a lot. I think the short answer is there are a whole lot more people that want to move forward than move backwards. That's 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 the short answer. I I, I do believe in humanity, and I do actually think that the, the people that want to move backwards are the most vocal, but are so massively outnumbered from a generational perspective, from a global perspective, from a corporate perspective. Um, I also find that it's very easy to doom scroll, so I don't. Right? I I very purposefully sort of block out a lot of the noise and focus yeah. on on really the reality. And I, you know, I, an example of this is um, we have two other talent initiatives. One's called Out Women that I started that has almost 6,000 LGBT women in it. And one called Out Forum, which is focused on board leadership because LGBT people weren't even included in the definition of board diversity until we started it eight years ago. Oh, wow. We've gotten, well, I think the current count is 112 multinationals to change their board policies to be LGBT inclusive um, by writing the policy and just asking them to do better. But that led to us working with the NASDAQ two years ago on their SEC requirement for board diversity. And they used out leadership structure in the filing and in their matrix. And so now every every NASDAQ listed company has to have a board diversity that is LGBT inclusive. And what's cool, and this goes to the example of sort of changes still happening, from last year to this year, there were 100, last year there were 112 NASDAQ listed companies that were LGBT inclusive at the board level. This year, there are 1,682. In one year, that many companies change their board policy. And that's in the middle of all the anti-woke stuff and all the terrible and you know, all of the things that we can focus on. But progress is still happening. Yeah. So I, I, I like to share that. Singapore decriminalized last August. That is major progress, right? There, there are still amazing things that are happening, but it's easy to, especially with the news cycle, right? That, mm-hmm. that's, that's not clickable, right? That's not super exciting and sexy. It's yeah. important. Um, but it, it doesn't, it doesn't get the, the airtime that the negativity does, I think. Yeah. Yeah. That that's great. Um, so if I'm listening to this podcast, I'm a 25 ish, something completely inspired, want to do what I love, want to be in business, but driven by values. Where do I start? What do I do? Well, first I'd say, figure out what it is that actually does drive you, right? What, what is, what is that one thing? And then ask yourself the question, can I do that in my current situation or not? Um, I get asked the question a lot, especially these out nexters who get excited and then they have to go back to a corporate environment that they think may not be cool, right? Or mm-hmm. they can't change the world. And and I patently disagree with that. I, I say all of these companies have used their economic platform, their power, their access, what they do every day. I mean, the out to, out to succeed research I mentioned, PwC helped us with that research and they had their teams around the world helping us build it. Ropes and Gray had their lawyer associates help us write the CEO breach that we built for all 67 countries where it's illegal to be gay. So those are things that people are doing through their platforms. 
So I, I think too often it's people think, oh, I've got to quit my job and go volunteer for a nonprofit or you, know, you, you can change the world doing exactly what you're doing. You just have to think, how can I use this platform that I have? Now, if you can't, and that's the, the, the sort of the conflict, then you've got to assess, okay, what can I do? Um, but I, I, I think the opportunity is to do both. Okay. Okay. So they make a change. They decide to do both. Then what? Well, I make a change. I, if they're doing both in the current environment that they're in, I think it's an opportunity for career leadership, right? Because if you're helping, I mean, just take my example, right? I was, my driver wasn't making tons of money from Merrill Lynch. My driver was one, keeping my job, right? But also changing the world and protecting these couples. And hopefully, you know, that led to a lot of different activism. But Merrill appreciated that. And I got access to senior leaders because I was successful, because I was driven by something, because I had a values-based approach. There were 16,000 financial advisors like me, but because I was doing something that mattered to me, I got that visibility. Mm-hmm. And so it, I, I think it's the same, whatever the, the issue is or the opportunity is, I think it goes back to what we talked about earlier, the idea that you're passionate about something and that you you let that drive your career. Thinking about careers and movement forward, two questions. What's next for you and what's next for the organization? Well, right now they're the exact same. Um, there's <laughs> one day there will be a nice division between the life of Todd Sears and our leadership. But right now that's that's not a thing. Uh, that, that's a life goal that I have um, to, to ultimately <laughs> build enough structure, have enough support so that I can be a, a, a chairman and have a bigger structure underneath me, uh, okay. which is what we hope to do. Uh, and then we're in the process of, of talking to people about building. Um, what's next for our leadership? We actually have our ESG summit launching tonight. Again, so you're an entrepreneur. Um, two years ago, I started talking to companies about their ESG strategies because every single one of our member companies obviously has an ESG strategy, but they're not connected. There's no sort of common, well, there are common threads, but they've never really sat down and talked about them. And the idea of embedding LGBT inclusive DEI into ESG, you can say that five times fast, you're, you're better than I am. Um, <laughs> not even going to try. <laughs> Right, exactly. Um, was something that I thought would be really important because the more things that are embedded in a business strategy, the the more successful it will be. Right, as we you know, saw in so many other things. And so I created a working group of forty six companies that we worked with the last eighteen months all around the world. We've had virtual sessions. We've had salons in London, Sydney, and New York. We're actually publishing a piece of research. And the idea is really to start a conversation, even though it's been happening for eighteen months. And the summit is being launched at the Nasdaq tomorrow, uh, which is pretty exciting. And we'll be sharing some data, some best practices, but the idea, and and I think this goes to the other piece that you asked in terms of how I'm keeping optimism in in the current environment, despite the fact that this anti-woke thing is very, very visible, companies are still making change. They are still, they know that sustainability has actually brought bottom line returns. They know that diversity has delivered results. That's what they've been doing it for 25 years. They don't do things that are not in their bottom line, sustainable best interest, just Mm because it's a nice thing to do. And so part of my goal is to remind people of that, but also have these businesses understand how they can do it differently in the current environment and continue to push progress for it. Yeah. When they get a little nervous, when they get a little nervous because they feel like they're getting pushed back again all of a sudden, how does that conversation go? How do you influence them to do what they want to do and get past some of those nerves because they know it's the right thing for the business? But I'm sure that conversation must be interesting. It it is, but I, I go back to actual just business bottom line facts. I just remind them, of the impact. What's what's fascinating is I, I've I'll use an example from a year ago. Actually, our CEO dinner in New York, uh, we had 22 CEOs, and four of them were bank CEOs. And all four bank CEOs had gotten letters from the state of Florida and the state of Texas saying, if you speak out against our trans laws, or if you move women out of state for healthcare, we will not do business with you. And to a person, all four of them said, "Tough. We're going to keep supporting our employees, supporting our clients. We know it's the right thing to do." Fast forward. What I love is that Texas decided they wouldn't work with those woke banks and they had to do bond offerings for the state of Texas with local banks. The Wall Street Journal six weeks ago estimated that Texas taxpayers are going to have to pay between $300 and $500 million in incremental interest because Texas wouldn't use the woke banks. There are economic consequences to discrimination. These people are trying to make a political point without actually living in reality. And so I remind leaders of that. The trans conversation is the same. There's a flight of talent. I was on Fox News Florida two weeks ago, and the tourism numbers from Florida have dipped. I'm like, direct correlation. 
You're yeah. having an economic consequence to your discrimination. You're losing talent. People are graduating from Florida universities and not wanting to stay in the state. People can't move talent to Florida. I mean, so I, I don't have to remind them too often, luckily, what's interesting. It's more about how can they continue doing it and not get pilloried. And mm. so much more of the the work that they're doing is we want to keep doing it, but don't give us an award right now. Don't get which we don't do anyway, but it's it's that idea. Yeah. It's, you know, yeah. We're not going to brag about it in the media because nobody wants to put their head above the parapet, but we're going to continue doing it because we know our clients demand it, our talent demands it, and we know it's the right thing. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Um, and I mean, again, the impact that you've had, I'm just sort of in awe of it. It's just amazing. <laughs> and I keep thinking in my head, I'm like, so how do we make this uh, um, the most important organization that everybody hears about because the work you're doing is amazing. And then I'm sort of fighting that going the impact and the influence that you've had in the way you've had has been so amazing, probably because of that. Right. So <clears throat> it's a, it's a challenge I would assume. It is, it is a bit of a catch 22. I think where we are now is the time to start getting more visibility, which is why doing podcasts like this matter. Um, mm-hmm. So people do actually start to hear about us. Um, if I had done it, well, so I'll use an example. So with Out on the Street, four of those six bank CEOs signed on to support marriage equality two weeks after our first summit and said that the conversations in the room hit, you know, turned on a light bulb. Um, and it was a big risk for them at that time to actually show up because that was the first time that CEOs had ever spoken on gay rights was at Out on the Street in 2011. Fast forward now, you know, how many hundreds of CEOs have spoken on LGBT issues and it's a business risk not to. And so the gravitas I think that we have now and the, you know, when you look at the list of leaders and companies, et cetera, it is actually time for us to be more visible because it does. I, I think that that'll be the only way that we can kind of push through some of these challenges that we have now. Yeah. And one of the interesting pieces just from an organization design perspective is it sounds like you're spending your time with the business leaders. Your entry point isn't HR or yeah, interesting. That's really uncommon. Really. It is. And, and it is challenging. Um, and I will say a uh, stumbling block that I didn't mention, I guess, that I should have is that we do have people that get frustrated by that. We do have HR leaders that are like, no, this is my world. Right. And, you know, and we have to sort of I think once people understand my motivation is change and business opportunity, we've actually been able to bring a lot of the HR diversity leaders who might have been threatened or frustrated by me connecting with their CEO directly mm. along because I was a chief diversity officer. I, I know the role. Yeah. And my goal is for them to be more successful. And the best companies actually now have figured out that, oh, wow, by Todd having a relationship with our CEO, that actually makes my life easier because we're going to do more. And it's an added benefit. It helps them be more successful. Um, but but HR is is not business focused in that way. I, mm-hmm. I, I I actually ask companies not to fund what they do with this from HR. I actually prefer them to fund it from a marketing, business development, talent development, talent acquisition, all of those things because we can drive ROI to those companies for that. I, I the term I use is return on equality. We trademarked it like ten years ago. Um, but there are a lot of things that HR needs to to fund and support that don't drive direct business ROI. And that's where they need to spend those funds. I don't want to take from the pots of, especially on the philanthropy side. That's why I also didn't want to be a C3. I really wanted the, the business leaders to pay for this because if they pay for it, they have skin in the game. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. And, and recognize that there's skin in the game and that there's something to be lost and there's something to be gained. And this is really important to the business, not just it is the right thing to do, but not just the right thing to do. It's yeah. not a nice to have. Well, and globally, right? The nice thing to do is subjective. But commerce is global. Everybody wants to be successful in business. Everybody needs great talent. And whether you're in Singapore or India or North Carolina, that's a, that's a common thread. Business is that common connector. It's a must have. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Um, a lot of really, really great insight. A lot of, you know, I've written down words like uh, innovate and business ideas um, and delegate and talent and equality. And there's just so much that you're doing right from a leadership perspective, which is amazing. Um, and I'm inspired by the work that you do for sure. Uh, but when you think about what you would leave somebody listening to this podcast with, whether they're that person who isn't connecting what they want to do with their values, or they're sort of sitting and thinking, what is their role within the organization? Or they're sitting there thinking, gosh, I wish I could be more honest about who I am in the workplace. What are, what are your final thoughts for them? Gosh, so many different, so many different challenges for one question. I know. Um, well, yeah. 
I think it may sound trite, but life is too short to be miserable. And optimism and happiness get you a long way. And if you're not happy in your situation, which could be driven by not being out, by not having a purpose, by not feeling supported by your organization, whatever it is, change it, right? The opportunity to be authentic to yourself is, I think, your most important obligation to yourself. Because if you're not authentic to yourself, you'll never be authentic to anybody else. And life success, career success, however you define it, comes from that. And I think ultimately happiness comes from that. Um, and that would be my advice. I don't think it can be too prescriptive, but authenticity is is what I think drives happiness. Yeah. Yeah. Well, happiness um, and being authentic and leaving people with the understanding that that matters and it's okay is I think a really good place to leave our audience today. So thank you so much for joining us. I cannot wait to see what you do next. And I'll say right now, if there's something I can do to support you in any way, um, please, please reach out. Thanks for giving me the opportunity to to share my story today. I really appreciate it. Absolute pleasure. Absolute pleasure. Thanks, Todd. What I'm left with is how do you connect the things that truly matter to you and that matter to the world that also make you happy? And that also, as an entrepreneur, are going to allow stability and sustainability in the work that you're doing. Do you or your team have blind spots around your market or the people you're potentially excluding? And how can your authenticity be your professional secret weapon? This is Unfolding Leadership. Thanks for listening.